Hi friends, week eight. I still can't believe it. Thank you for being a part of this Alpha experience via Zoom. Uh, I hope you have enjoyed it. It is our prayer that it's been a blessing to you, uh, that you've grown closer in your relationship with God, and also gained some new friendships. As a follow-up to Alpha, we want to encourage you to connect with a small group for the sermon series, Thy Kingdom Come. Uh, the content is written by, their, uh, by our pastors and is based on their sermons each week. Uh, the small group lesson is available in the weekly bulletins or on our website. Uh, we'll be offering several options to connect via Zoom or in person for six weeks, March 15th through April 30th. Uh, go to fargohope.org slash adults to register beginning March 3rd. As we conclude this course, uh, we want to give you an opportunity to give us some feedback. Uh, next week, you'll be getting a survey monkey in your email that we ask you to complete. Uh, also, let us know if you would be, be interested in helping with a future Alpha course. Our final Alpha message is done today by pastoral intern Ben Sullivan. Uh, he'll be talking on the topics, what about the church and why and how should I tell others? The faith story is given by Dave Monsabratton. Thanks again for tuning in. Hi, my name is David Monsabratton. The story I'm about to tell you started a long time ago, uh, but it's what God can do in a life when you uh, allow him in to lead you. Uh, I was brought up in a Christian home uh, my parents, uh, along with my three brothers and three sisters, we all went to church, Sunday school, confirmation, everything that we're supposed to do as young people. And, but as I grew up, I uh, started thinking things in my own way. And one of the things I did was, I was 13 years old, I tried alcohol for the first time and really liked what it did for me. And uh, there's a Bible verse I found that goes along with that, uh, Proverbs 16:25 says, "There's a way that seems right to a man, but leads to destruction." And in my case, it almost did. Uh, like I said, at 13, I tried alcohol, and uh, just skipping farther ahead, over the years, uh, the drinking got a little worse, a little, little more all the time. And I found myself in places sometimes where I'd start drinking and I just didn't stop. I couldn't stop. It just like it got a hold of me. So uh, over the years, I kind of tried to keep the most of it hid, but it just got worse and worse. And by the time I was in my early 20s, it was getting pretty bad. But then I had also met this young lady in our community that took a fancy to and asked her to marry me and she said yes and of course after you're married there's very little you can hide and uh, after being married four years that's when things really really went bad. I started drinking on a uh, Sunday and it uh, lasted right through till the following Wednesday. I walked out on my wife and uh, at that time we had two little kids my job, uh, just everything. The, the alcohol had completely taken over. And the last time I drank, I was alone in my old pickup and uh, I, I had just had enough. I thought, if this is life, I want no more of it. And I was ready to end the whole thing. And, and then I just thought about growing up and the things I'd been taught and uh, then I just said, God, if you're really there, I need help. And I went from a broken, confused, uh, alcohol-addicted young man to a person that knew exactly what he had to do. It just, in a blink of an eye, it changed that much. And it turned out, uh, when I did that, I, the drink I had, I threw away, uh, and that was the last drink I had in my life. And, I knew exactly who I had to go and talk to. It was a, a guy I wouldn't have chosen, but I knew that was who I had to go and see. And he got me in touch with his pastor, who got me in touch with a drug and alcohol counselor, and uh, his name is Bob, and uh, we got to be friends. He's the guy that got me into AA. 
And when I got into AA, I started hearing these guys talking about their higher power. And most of them believed it to be God. Well, I, I knew who God was. I believed in him. I believed in Jesus. But I had no personal relationship with him. And through AA and getting back to church and now listening to what the pastor said, not just sitting there, uh, things started to uh, kind of make sense. There was, after that, last night I drank, there was something new in my life and I couldn't understand it. I didn't know exactly what was going on. But over time, I started reading my Bible, uh, keeping, kept on going to church regularly, and uh, things kept getting better. And, uh, in uh, our, my wife and I's relationship. And I was reading in the book of Proverbs, chapter three, verses five and six, where it says to trust in the Lord with all your might. Don't rely on your own understanding, but acknowledge him in all your ways, and he will guide your paths. Well, I was still a little confused over all of this, even though things were a lot better and uh, so I just kept doing what I was doing. I kept going to church and, uh, you know, family life was getting a lot better. And uh, uh, I was reading in the Bible one night, it was uh, 2 Corinthians 12, 9. And it's where God said, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. And I, I looked at that drinking, uh, that alcohol problem I had, as a weakness and there sure was a newfound strength dealing with that and it, it didn't seem like I was doing it but it seemed like uh, it was just there and I remember right after that you know when I came home after that last drunk I had two bottles of whiskey under the seat of my pickup I knew exactly what I had to do with them and it was to dump them out on the ground and watch that stuff just soak into the ground and uh, away from me and at that time I felt like it was God telling me Dave you take the first step and I'll carry you the rest of the way and uh, he really has been uh, and through these times after that uh, night I suppose it was about eight eight or nine months into this thing and uh, things were going real good I was still just a little kind of confused about everything that had gone on. But uh, one night I was reading in uh, the book of John, chapter 8, verses 31 and 32. And he was talking, Jesus was talking to some of the people around him. And he told them, he who abides in my words will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Well, then it all came crashing in on me. I knew the truth about what this new thing I was feeling in my life, and that was his power working within me and I knew how badly I messed up my life by living by my own rules and I knew how badly I needed Jesus Christ for my personal Savior and that was the night that I just kind of rested back and said yes Lord I believe and that was 47 years ago and it's getting close to 48 years now and uh, when I think back on that one verse, uh, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. God has taken care of everything in my life. And <clears throat> I mentioned early on that young lady I met in my home community back there. Uh, God not only healed my life, but he, he saved our marriage, he saved my job, and he saved my life. And uh, we have been married now for uh, almost 53 years. So if there's a problem in your life, don't be scared to admit that and seek God's help because he's most definitely there. And uh, I praise him for every day I get that I'm sober and uh, living this new life that he's given me. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to our final session of Alpha, if you've been with us the entire time. Uh, this is our last uh, time meeting here together today, and we're talking about something incredibly important, one of the most influential pieces of my Christian life, and that is the church. 
We're talking about the church. Uh, for many of us, uh, we've probably had at least some involvement with the church. For me, I knew I grew up in church. I was baptized in a church, confirmed in a church. I work in a church. Uh, my wife Jade and I met in, in a church, and if it wasn't for COVID, we uh, likely would have gotten married in a church too. Uh, there's just a lot of things that I've, I've grown up having some like fascination with the church. I have a memory of my mom and I, uh, she has often told me this story where she took me to see a friend of hers in the hospital and we were uh, off to go and see her and after we were done she was walking back to her car and she was looking at, uh, around for me, I was six or seven years old at the time and she, I was nowhere to be found and so she kind of went into mother panic mode a little bit and went back in and was kind of looking around and saw this little boy uh, standing in this chapel and, and so she kind of noticed it was me, she kind of came up without me knowing and I had my eyes closed and my hands out and just remember like six seven years old I didn't probably even know much about church at the time but I just uh, said the words I'm gonna speak to the people and my mom just I think was this like prophetic moment almost for her she saw at this young age I just had this fascination with the church but when we look at our culture our culture has a lot of different views about the church uh, some people think the church is essential, uh, while other people think it's uh, the least, uh, the least uh, important thing that we could ever have in this life. Some people love the church. Uh, some people absolutely hate the church. And so what we're going to do in our time together today is we're going to uh, look at and answer, hopefully, the question, uh, what is the church and why does it exist in the world? What is the church at its deepest core and, and why does it exist in the world? And what I want to uh, hopefully help us to see is that the church is not just necessarily an available option that's, uh, you know, a possibility for believers to be a part of, but it's one of the most essential things uh, that we have as a part of our Christian faith. And so what I want to do today is I want to uh, answer five different questions according to Scripture and see what uh, the church is made up of. But before I begin, I want to uh, help us to see, too, that uh, we are the church, right? The church is not just a building, so often when we think of the church, we think of a building, uh, but it's not just a place where we go, but the church is who we are, that you and I are the church as followers of Jesus Christ. We are gathered together to be the church in this world. And so we're going to take a look at these five pieces here. The first piece that we're going to look at is that the church is about friendship. The church is about friendship. In John chapter 15, verse 15, uh, Jesus says to his disciples, he says, I no longer call you servants, but I call you friends. It's just this amazing statement that, of course, we are servants of uh, the living God, but he goes the next step further in making this personal, and he says, I call you friends. That the, uh, friendship is one of the greatest, most like intimate things we can have in this life. I want to encourage you to uh, think about this with me. Uh, in the world, you make friends. And in the church, you have friends. And it's just a matter of getting to know them. I think about even our time at Alpha, especially in small group. Uh, many of you, if this is your first time, maybe you came and maybe you knew some of the people in Alpha in your small group. Maybe you didn't know anybody. Uh, but over the course of being able to kind of get to know them and spend time with them, uh, you've gotten to know them as friends. You've uh, spent time together uh, sharing parts of your life, dive, diving into God's word, into the Bible together, maybe even sharing laughs together, sharing tears and uh, struggles maybe that you're going through. And through all of these experiences, we see that friendship has the potential to grow. And what I've come to know is that friends are really important to have in this life when things are going well. But what's even more important to understand is that friends are essential in life when things are not going well. When something happens in life and we just don't know where else to turn, to turn to a group of friends, namely our friends who make up the church to where we can find a peace and a security that goes far beyond human understanding to find the presence of God in friends. I even think about it in terms of building a fire. To build a fire, you need wood. You need logs of wood and then you light the match in it and it creates this huge flame. As time goes on, that flame begins to die down as the, the logs begin to go down. And uh, where I'm going with this is in the book of Hebrews, uh, the Apostle Paul, he encourages us to uh, not forsake the gathering of meeting together, right? We're called to meet together as this group of friends. And just as we're called to meet together, also as we look at a, a fire, uh, we're called to keep putting logs on that fire if we want to see the flame continue to, to go and to continue to be a flame and to be on fire. As time goes on, if we're not continuing to add logs and continuing to put those there, eventually that flame is going to die out. And 
In that same way, if we stop gathering together as God's people, eventually the church will die out. This is what we're called to. So we see that the church is about friends. The second one we're going to look at is the church is about family. The church is about family. We're going to even go the very next step. Uh, he says, uh, I call you friends, but even we're going to look at 1 John chapter 5, verse 1, where John writes this. He says, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ and is born of God and everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. So you see, if you're a follower of Jesus, you are a son or a daughter of God. We are children of God in faith. He sees us as his own children. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. This is this family of faith that has been formed. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, this is your family. And if you haven't uh, yet come to, you know, a knowledge or faith in Jesus Christ, this is your potential family. You know, you may look at this and go, that's awesome, or go, oh, man, these people are crazy, or whatever it is. But you can see this is a potential family that is av available to you. The church, what we need to understand, too, and what's really uh, been transformational in my life is that the church is not just an organization that we take part in. It's not just an organization that we, uh, that we uh, come to. Uh, it's a place where we belong. It's a place and a family that we belong, and you belong here as a part of God's church as we are gathered together. And that kind of helps us lead into the third piece here. Uh, the church is about friendship. It's about family. And the third one here we're going to look at is that the church is about home, that the church is home. We're going to look at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 21 through 22. Here the Apostle Paul is talking about us being a holy temple, and he says these words. He says, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his Spirit. So you see, like me, hopefully you felt this way before. When you come into a church, there's just something about it. It just feels like home. At least that's, you know, the desire is you're greeted by someone and you just feel that this is not a place where you're judged or you're ridiculed or you're made fun of or persecuted. No, this is a place where you find belonging, where you are welcomed, you are loved, and you are encouraged in this place where we can come together. And notice in his scripture, he says, you're being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. We are gathered together in this home, and through faith, we see the work of God that is uniting us together in this home. It's an amazing place when we come in, we experience together the presence of Jesus. What we see in the Old Testament is that to experience the presence of Jesus, you would have to go to the temple, and there's a process by which we would encounter the living God. But now we know that we encounter him through faith in his Son. And when we come together, there's just something special that happens that brings us together in such a unity that just is so beautiful. And we experience God together, and it just feels like home. And the next piece we're going to look at is that the church is about Jesus. The church is about Jesus, and this may be one of those obvious things, but I'm, I'm going to go in a little different direction here than maybe some of us are uh, expecting. I, I think about uh, the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 9. Uh, Acts chapter 9, we see Paul uh, is someone who uh, is first introduced here as someone who hates Christians. He just persecutes Christians. He actually gave the authorization for Christians to be put to death. He did not want to see Christianity continue to be formed in the Roman world. And so one day he and his men are walking down this road in a town called Damascus and out of nowhere comes this beaming light out of the sky and this voice is speaking to Paul and all the people around him fall on their face and they are just passed out and as he's trying to just look up at what's going on Jesus uh, tells Paul he says Paul this is Jesus whom you persecute why do you persecute me Paul and I just want to pause there for a second and I just want to uh, help us to think about what's actually happening here. Because the Apostle Paul, he never actually met Jesus. He never knew Jesus when Jesus was physically on this earth. And so when Jesus says, why are you persecuting me, Paul? I can only imagine, at least in some sense, Paul is probably like, man, how can I be persecuting you? He said, who are you, Lord? He doesn't even know him, right? He's not persecuting him in his mind. He's persecuting his people. But there's something here, this connection that Jesus seems to be making between him and his people, and what I, I think he's getting at here is the Apostle Paul even goes on to speak about later in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 27. In this passage, the Apostle Paul, he says, Now you are the body of Christ. Each one of you is a part of it. 
Man, see, we're each part of this body of Christ. I want you to think about this concept with me. Uh, How can people today know who Jesus is? How can we know who he is? He never wrote a book. He never starred in a movie. He never uh, ruled in an earthly or a political kingdom. He never ruled a nation. He never did any of these things that make people well known today. But what did he do? He formed a community. He formed a community. He had his small group of of 12 men who he walked with alongside in their lives. It's kind of like small groups in Alpha. You know, I do middle school ministry. We have a small group culture at our church, right? It's the small group uh, that he formed. But also, he he spoke to multitudes of people also. He would speak to them in parables when they were gathered, even hundreds, thousands, maybe even at a time. And that's what, what we're doing right now, this large group gathering. He formed this community. And what we see in uh, John chapter 17 is he goes this next step again and and it says that uh, Jesus, when he prayed for us and prayed for those who believe in him, he prayed for such a unity. He prayed that this community of believers would be one just as he and the Father are one. I think about just that closeness between me and my father. You know, how much more close is Jesus and his father? You know, they are almost inseparable. They are perfectly united, perfectly one, and he calls us to be one just as they are one. This is the calling of our life as we are the church. And he says because of this, he wants us to be one so that those around us, so that the world may believe. Right? We look at the church, we see who is the church, what is the church? We are the church. And then answering the question, why does the church exist in the world? So that the world may know that Jesus Christ is Lord. So that the world may know that the Father in heaven sent the Son for the redemption of our souls. So that the world may know that we are his disciples. We see that his calling for us in our life is to be one in Christ. And in so doing, uh, this is our calling on the, for us to be the church, to live into this high calling on our lives. This is one of the greatest callings we could ever have. And so before we get to our final point, we've talked about how the church is friendship, the church is family, that the church is our home, and that the church is rooted in Christ. And to finish out, we're going to look at one other piece, and that is that the church is about love. That the church at its deepest level is about love. And uh, we're going to look at a scripture that Jade and I used as one of our wedding scriptures, actually. It's Ephesians chapter 5. We're going to look at verse 25 and then again at verse 32. Uh, This is what Paul writes. He says, Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. He says, This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and his church. You see, church should be the greatest place that we experience the most depth of love in this life. To know, you know we, many of us have heard that scripture, John three sixteen, right? For God so loved the world that he, he did what? He gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life, right? I look at uh, my wife Jade and I, this is talking about marriage, and if someone were to look at our relationship, at least in some sense, they would probably see some sort of love there. And yet, the love that Jade and I have for each other, without the love of God, really has no foundation greater than that, right? It's not really that deep. It's, we think about this being rooted in a love that is so much greater than just the love that two people can naturally have with one another. No, our foundation is actually the love of God that is within us, right? He says, greater love knows none than this than for one to give his life for his friends, And that's what we're looking at in this passage in Ephesians chapter 5. He says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. This is this self-sacrificial love that when we come to church, we know that we are loved continually, that we are loved wholeheartedly and completely by our God. This is rooted in Christ's love. And this foundation of Christ's love has the, the, found, the foundation to make all the other uh, relationships that we have within the church just naturally work. That we come together and it's this love that we have with each other that's not just like a superficial love, but it is grounded in such a deep love that God has for us and for his people. And see, at the church, Jesus loves us where we are. He meets us where we are, but he doesn't leave us where we're at. 
That's what we see as part of the church. Oftentimes when we think of the church, we think of the church kind of like a museum uh, where it's a bunch of holy people uh, that are kind of up on a pedestal and we can go around and look at all these holy people. But that's not really what the church is about at all. Jesus actually said something similar. He said, I have not come for the healthy, but I've come for the sick. I've not come to call the righteous, but to call sinners to repentance. This is the calling of the church right? That we come in broken. We come in sinful. We come in yearning for the grace and the mercy of Jesus Christ, and we find forgiveness of sin. We find encouragement to turn from our sin, to find life in Christ, and to walk in him and leave our old ways behind. And we find a love from those around us to help us to move forward in a way that honors God here together. We come broken, but we leave redeemed. That's part of my story, man. I know that in, my, in myself, I am not perfect. I am one of the most broken and sin-filled people that I know, if not the most broken person I know. But when I come into the church, I'm reminded of the grace and the love and the beauty of Christ and, and the mercy that he has for me in my life and that I'm only able to enter into his gate someday because of his mercy that he's had in my life, that he redeems a broken sinner like me. It's just fascinating. And that is the beauty that we come into the church and that is our story as we are unified in one body. And so as we close out our time together here today and as we're looking at the church in this time, uh, one, of the, one of the greatest passions uh, of my soul that I want to encourage you with today is to be the church. Right now is maybe arguably one of the diff most difficult times to be the church as we've all experienced just this turmoil this past year, this division. And uh, for many uh, in the world, they've kind of drawn away from church and, and little by little have just kind of disassociated themselves with it. But this is the time greater than any other to rise up and to be the church. Jesus said about himself, he said, I am the light of the world. But then he looked at his disciples and his people and he said, you are the light of the world. He calls us to be the light of Christ and to meet together and to be his church in this world, to be gathered as a community of friends, to go the next step and to be this family that unites together in this feeling, in this sense of being home. And this foundation we have is rooted in Christ and we move forward together in the love of our God that shows and represented itself through the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is why we gather as the church. This is who we are and this is why we exist. So let's rise up and let's be the church together. Uh, Father, we come before you right now and ask for your mercy. Uh, thank you for Holy, uh, the Holy Spirit weekend. We pray for your spirit to come upon each and every one of us, Lord. I pray that you're continuing to draw us to you so that we may continue to move forward in faith together, turning from sin, finding newness of life in Jesus Christ as we are unified together as one body. And Lord, as the world is uh, going in one direction, Lord, help the church to rise where we are right now and to remain the church, to be steadfast in this love that you have for us, Lord. And even if all go one way, Lord, uh, that is departing from you, help us to stand firm in the love that you have for us, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.